Alrighty guys, so what is going on? And welcome to another cover video. Today we is watching a video called Surviving Actual Military Combat. This is a video by the Infographic Show. So actually we're gonna get straight into this shit. I don't even need to use the speaker for this. It's gonna be eating in the video. We're gonna be eating. Uh we're gonna be uh smoking the shines. So <laughs> How does he get him? He's only 20 years old. I know Chance is wondering. I got a guy, bro. This is dude. He's got my back. Okay. He's got my back. Let's go. Note to our viewers, due to the sensitive nature of some of the details in this episode, certain elements have been changed to protect operational security. At least three city blocks have been turned into a bona fide war zone, and the night is filled with the roar of weapons fire, flash of muzzles, and tracers from our M249s and 240s reaching out into the buildings like sweeping laser beams. This was not how it was supposed to have gone down, but in the dusty corners of Afghanistan, it's about as well as one could expect, I suppose. We are four teams, ten men each, an overstrength platoon, so to speak. Only we lack a lot of the firepower of a real infantry platoon. We've got no recoilless rifles, for instance, and only two laws amongst all 40 of us. Once more, we weren't supposed to need them. Once more, we definitely did. Thankfully, the enemy doesn't have armored vehicles, but they've sicked three converted trucks mounted with anti-air cannons on the buildings we've been using for cover. A 240 took one out, the laws got the other two. Then they put a round into the vehicle the 240 took out for good measure. I'm trying to keep an ear to both my team and the command's radio nets. Being team leader all too often means having to do three or four things mm. at the same time, while trying really hard not to die. My team's taken up position inside a small abandoned warehouse of some kind. The walls are thick enough to not crumble under the fire of AKs, and the upper floor has some great vantage points to watch enemy movement on the street in front and behind us. The other three teams are strung in a rough L-shaped formation across various other buildings to our 9 o'clock. We make up the far right element of our formation. Next to me, our sharpshooter is singing a nursery rhyme to himself, pausing only to take shots. Yo, this is so fucking funny, bro. This is why I like this guy on the info map of the show. Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, boom. Little lamb, Mary had a little lamb, boom. Whose fleece was white as boom. Snow. <laughs> it's a mental trick I've seen him use before. That's perfect. Something to help him <laughs> I know. And the fear. The fighting in front of us is too close for him to engage, so he's bopping targets a quarter mile away, threatening one of our other teams. Occasionally, somebody will fire up at his position, but one of the saws downstairs is always there to cut him down if they do. Still, all it would take is one RPG, and he and I would be goners in this small upstairs room. Best not to think about that. Whiskey One, be advised, Reaper Four confirms VIP has been KIA'd by hostiles. Shit, somewhere two miles above our heads, an Air Force drone is watching the firefight with his multiple cameras. Its infrared camera spotted the VIP we came here to rescue, and it's recorded his murder in some back alley a few hundred yards away. I keep my radio on the command net. Whiskey One, Whiskey Four, VIP is KIA. Do we extract? There's a long wait on the command net. While on my team net, my guys all over the building are calling targets out to each other. I check my watch in the dark. It's been 33 minutes since hostile contact. What started out as a very target-rich environment has finally started to diminish. My guys are calling less and less hostiles over the net. Or maybe the hostiles are just trying to pull back and retreat. Whiskey leaders be advised. Top says terminate. Acknowledge. Terminate. We failed to reach our VIP in time, so now we're gonna do what we really came out here to do. Eliminate every single hostile. This op has basically just turned into an extermination mission. Four days before, all team leaders got called into a briefing. You always know when it's going to be something serious and very complicated. If only the team leads get called in for a mission brief. Less complicated and What's therefore less dangerous ops typically get mass briefings. When we finally oh. get our brief, I can't help but I sign again and wonder. Anyway, so this one is going to be a doozy. Forces friendly to the Taliban have taken a local village elder and one of his sons hostage. Elder and one of his sons? They shot in the head in the middle of the street as a warning. Them? This village has been collaborating with NATO forces and in return, NATO's been giving them food and other aid. The message is clear. Taliban is still here. And if you cooperate with the Americans or their allies, this is what you get in return. Our goal is simple. Rescue the VIP. Except nobody believes it's possible. In fact, we're not even sure why the enemy took hostages in the first place. It's well outside of their MO. Typically, they simply torture, rape, and kill anybody they think is collaborating with the Americans. The intel guys think that the Taliban is going to try and put this guy and his surviving son on trial before executing him. It's a total shock.
show trial, but it's meant to try and show the Afghan population that they are very much still in power. The intelligence guys don't want that to happen, and we can't let the Taliban have a chance at claiming any amount of legitimacy. Realistically, though, there's no chance of rescue for this poor guy. As soon as we make first contact with the enemy, they're going to put a bullet in his head. No way are they going to let us score a huge morale victory and actually rescue this village elder. Sadly, this man's life has become nothing more than a football to be kicked back and forth in a great big game of propaganda. We put this guy in danger when he offered to cooperate with us, so the least we could do is our damned best to rescue him if we can get him good but the real mission is loud and clear we're there to neutralize every single hostile we come across nato does not negotiate with terrorists and we're here to show that if you resort to kidnapping for extortion and propaganda purposes we'll eradicate you completely there can be no other response otherwise kidnapping and other hostage taking will spread like a cancer throughout the nation we have to cut this cancer out immediately and prevent its growth our primary objective, though, is to rescue the VIP alive, and we're going to do that to the best of our abilities. Intelligence has been watching the perp's movements, and finally spotted where they're holding him. A small industrial city near the eastern mountains. Makes sense. They were probably hoping to smuggle him across the border into Pakistan tribal areas, where the Taliban could hold its fake trial in relative safety. Pakistani border forces are supposed to stop militants crossing back and forth across the border, but everybody knows they're double-dealing NATO and helping the militants out. They don't want a free Afghanistan, they want the Taliban to remain in power and act as a buffer against Iran. We make our insertion at night via two Chinooks escorted by Apaches. The choppers drop us off about 50 miles outside of town so that we can hoof it the rest of the way. We're not using vehicles, and we move only at night time so that we don't give ourselves away. Not an easy feat for a force of 40. But the wilderness in this part of the country is very vast, and most of the land is inhospitable. We come across a single group of herders in the middle of the first night who practically need a new pair of pants after seeing a troop of 40 Americans armed to the teeth descend down a wadi toward them. We get the herders the equivalent of $50 each, an astronomical sum for these dirt poor Afghanis, and hope that it buys us their silence. If not, well, we did come looking for a fight. The farmers bless us several times and offer us cheese for our journey. There's not nearly enough for all of us, but we gladly accept what they offer. The Afghan people are incredibly generous and most honorable. The gesture is one of respect and kinship, and it sets us at ease about having our movement betrayed. On the second night of our march, we near the small city and widen the distance between each team, putting about a half a mile between us. In the dark, rocky wilderness, it's very hard to spot us, but we have a couple of Australian Special Air Service guys with us who are incredible scouts and guides. They pick a path through the wilderness that keeps us moving along wadis and canyons hidden from prying eyes. Surprisingly, the infiltration into the city's outskirts should be easier than remaining hidden throughout our wilderness trek. Most of the city has been abandoned due to the proximity of the Pakistani border and the prevalence of foreign fighters sneaking into Afghanistan through Pakistan. And besides, the city was never very big to begin with. Some sort of small industrial center, likely supporting the mining industry in the mountains. All around the outskirts, buildings have been abandoned. Moving through them should be easy. Our intelligence said that the VIP is held on the eastern edge of the city, and we each have an aerial snapshot of the target building, along with the streets around it. Using our digital pads, we can pull up a map of the city, and every few minutes it gets updated with red pings from confirmed hostiles that the Air Force drone loitering silently overhead has detected. Its powerful night vision and infrared cameras have spotted a few armed checkpoints in the city, but it seems like they don't have a mobile patrol force. An insurgency is made up of some pretty fierce fighters, but their tactics are seriously lacking. YouTube is the number one site for millions of creators online, but as more people flood to the platform, it's- what? All four teams move into the city outskirts at once. Our rifles are silenced, but the silencers don't last very long and aren't nearly as effective as Hollywood makes them out to be. The key to success is going to be move fast and hit them hard. As soon as we make contact, a quick reaction force will land on Blackhawks and Chinooks on the west end of the city, trapping the enemy between us. Once things get loud, several air assets, to include Apaches right now on the station several miles away, will come in to deliver air support. And Air Every Force man with a $5,000 gun or a $20,000 gun. But generally, we'd like to avoid flattening the entire That's town. That's what I was just thinking Fast about. Fast forward 30-something odd minutes, things got loud, everything went sideways. All four teams got pinned down by a huge number of hostiles. Typical op stuff. Worst of all, though, VIP got himself KIA'd by the bad guys who now know they're losing this fight. Nobody wants to drop heavy ordnance in the middle of a city, so instead our air support gave us a few strafing runs with cannons. The fighting's been door-to-door, -door, and most of the job is going to be on us, and not the Air Force. Still, 
know what I would do to have just three or four buildings imploded with a 500 pound bomb. It's now on to phase two of this fight. There's no hope of hostage rescue, so we have to do our best to deter any other hostiles from trying this shit again, mostly by killing as many of them as we can. It's the only way to deter this type of tactic, even if it's thoroughly unpleasant. The teams move again, and it's a stand-up, real-life, Wild West door-to-door -door fight the whole way. These guys may be losing, but they're fanatics, and surrender isn't an option. That's not a problem for me, or at least it won't be until I get home from this mess and have to start sifting faces out of my memory. What is a problem, though, is what me and my team find next. We breach a small gathering place, something like a gymnasium. Inside, there's three hostels, though they're all dead. One of them took a while to die. I could tell because there's a long streak of blood going from the outside door to where he crawled to and died. There's other figures in here, though, huddled up against the far corners. Somebody yells out, civilians, before any of us accidentally open up fire. We've been trained to keep our cool under severe circumstances, but all of our nerves are shot, and we've got a few of our own at casualty collection points a few hundred yards away, some of which won't be going home. Nobody feels like taking any chances. We keep on keeping our cool, though. The civilians are women, but most of them are missing the typical burkas they wear. They're dressed in rough linen garments, and there's smaller figures with them, too. Children. I get a sinking feeling about what we've just discovered. The jihadists are fond of abducting women and children, forcing them into marriages. In essence, it's sex slavery. But that's not what this is. <coughs> Almost at the same time as I hear the women start shouting an alarm, I take in the contents of several tables in front of me. There's ball bearings, gravel, random pieces of small, sharp metal. There's also linen vests. And if I had to stake my life on it, blocks of homemade explosives. This is a suicide bomb factory. The Taliban and their jihadist allies have taken to using mentally retarded children and adults to carry out suicide attacks against NATO and Afghan government forces. The reasoning is simple and devastatingly effective. One NATO soldier would suspect a mentally retarded individual, let alone a child, to be a suicide bomber. The realization sinks in and suddenly nothing I've seen or done in this godforsaken piece of the world matters. This is the black heart of hell itself. I barely even notice that the women are shouting an alarm though and turn just in time to spot a child, maybe 13 or 14, rushing toward us. It's not like in the movies, time doesn't slow down to a crawl for you. It only does that weeks, months, or years after the fact when you're home in bed and your brain makes you relive the memory. I have to piece together what happened from memory. I remember somebody shouting, one of our guys. There was a roar of an M4 carbine, but it was only one shot, not our usual double tap to confirm a kill, and not a quick burst of fire from the rifle's three-round burst fire setting. It was just one shot, a single, reluctant shot, center mass on a child. It didn't matter, though. The detonator had already been triggered. When I came to, I remember myself thinking, that's the second time. You can't keep taking concussions like that. I follow the NFL. I know how bad concussions can be. Your brain is funny like that. It pulls the most random concerns to the forefront of your mind, smack dab in the middle of a crisis situation. I remember talking to a guy once who got shot up pretty bad and things didn't look good for him. He told me that he just kept thinking silly random things like, I really need to get a haircut. I let my hair grow too long. It's definitely out of ranks. Concussions was... So what, what, what were you... What we Azim has told me this that the the fact that when when he was drowning Azim told me this that that drowning wasn't wasn't the scariest part so like did you have any funny thoughts? Uh yeah, it's actually um at first when I jumped in to the water and I came up, um, I was like I said I had swam in a while so um I was moving I was um moving my arms but I wasn't kicking my legs and I slipped under and as soon as I slipped under I kind of gave up I'm like man fuck it. And then as I was like sinking, I was I flashed back to when me and Aaron were walking to Charlie's that day on the walk there. Uh, we were talking about what happens after you die and reincarnation and shit. So I was thinking about that. That's <clears throat> ironic as fuck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, that's what I was thinking. It was ironic. I like how ironic that we were just I'm talking about that. I'm about right to find now. out. I'm about to drown right now. Yep. <laughs> I'm like, wow, that was a red flag. <laughs> Death flag it was. All right. But yeah, and then fucking, um, I started thinking, like, you know what? Nah, fuck this, man. Like, I can't fucking go down. I didn't, I'm like, me and Charlie didn't make it on YouTube yet. I didn't fucking do so much shit. I'm like, man, fuck Charlie this Charlie just had a baby. I became her, I became her, like, almost uncle-ish. He is her, he's her blood uncle. Because we're blood brothers. Let's finish this video, though. Yeah.
my silly thought, and I suppose it was really just my brain rebooting itself. Things became hazy after that. I'd end up getting dragged back to our casualty collection point, took a large ball bearing directly to the hip, and it shattered half the bone. From that point on, sitting for long periods of time would become extremely uncomfortable and eventually painful. Cuts and bruises other places too, broken wrists from another ball bearing. Incredibly nothing life-threatening, although the armor plate on my vest took several hits. My lack of life-threatening injuries was a miracle shared by the other three guys that had been inside when the vest went off. Everyone got hurt, some worse than others, but nobody died. It's a pretty good day. I wish I could say the same for the half dozen or so women in that building. The kid had been a lot closer to them than us, and I can blame faulty low-yield homemade explosives for our survival, but they still had enough punch to decimate several of the women. I remember seeing them extracted out along with our wounded, though I never really found out what happened to the survivors. Never even found out where they'd come from. Were they given up by families that supported the Taliban or its jihadist allies? Were these the mentally retarded daughters and sisters of jihadists used as suicide bomber fodder because they couldn't possibly know better? Or were they abducted from local families and set loose against them? I guess I never really wanted to know. You can only take so much evil in, and sometimes it's best to leave the details out. I know guys who didn't learn that lesson, and I want a chance at a normal life one day. A life back in the real world, comfortably numb in American suburbia somewhere, with my biggest concern being that my neighbor's grass was growing better than mine. Now to see what it would be like in this situation for most people, go watch How Can You Survive in a War Zone with No Military Training. If you like this <clears> video, then you'll... Alright, you guys. Got another girl. Definitely a great video, so mm -hmm. uh, if you enjoyed, subscribe, we'll see you guys in the next video. I swear to God, I wasn't scratching my nuts right there. I dropped the Skittle. And, I, and yeah. the next video we're bringing to you guys is Dragon Ball Z Abridged Episode 2. So yeah, join Post Notification Squad. And peace.